Well, my dear friend, it's uh, an honor and privilege for me to be here amidst uh, Generation Next bursting with ideas. And I would like to thank the NDIM for giving me this opportunity. You all are the future of the country and those who are born in the last quarter of the previous century are the blessed one also. Uh, they are seeing India emerging on the global scene and you will see India to be a super economic power by 2030. We will be the third largest economy bypassing Germany and Japan by 2020. We are already a $2 trillion economy and now we are endeavoring to become a $5 trillion economy by 2022. And uh, this $5 trillion economy as now will continue to be a service driven economy which will contribute to around $3 trillion. Manufacturing will add $1 billion and agriculture <laughs> under $1 billion. Exports and import would be an integral part of the economy and it will continue to contribute to around 40% of the GDP, raising its level from around a trillion dollar at moment to two trillion dollar by 2025. I personally feel that it is a very modest target which the government is fixing. I would like to take a target of around 2.5 trillion dollar of international trade. And things have been uh, pretty good for India. If you look at the kind of growth which we are witnessing was something which was unbelievable 10 years, 10 years before. One day I was talking to the chairman of the telecom commission and he was heading the commission in 2013. He recommended a host of measures, policy measures and then he said that these measures are implemented. We will be raising the telecom industry to $70 billion by 2018. We crossed 100 billion mark last year. We are adding two million dollar mobile subscriber every year which is much more than the population of few of the countries. The same is true of foreign direct investment. Mr. Ratan Tata was heading the investment commission and he recommended a lot of relaxation of the FDI policy which will enable India to attract 200 billion dollar FDI between 2015 to 2020. In fact, between April 2015 to December 2017, we have already attracted $219 billion of FDI. Last year, we attracted around $160 billion of the FDI. Uh, the country is full of opportunity. Take the international trade also. Last year, we ended with $303 billion of <coughs> merchandise exports, $192 billion of the service exports, though of course, we are having a trade deficit as our imports also cross $160 billion in goods and around $142 billion in services. But these kind of uh, integration in the world is creating huge opportunity for a country like India. And uh, though of course uh, we are thriving on our integration with the world, it is the domestic economy which is helping us to grow. Even India sailed through the worst global crisis in 2018 because of its domestic economy which has become one of the fastest growing economy in the last quarter of 2017-18 and we hope that uh, very soon we will see the economy moving to a double digit growth if it is supported by exports also and we are looking at around 15 percent growth in exports on year on year basis though there are a number of challenges which will come in the way we all know that rupee is depreciating which to a common person seems that it is adding to the exports, but everything in global market is related to your competitors. So if your competitors' currencies are depreciating at a faster pace, you are not a gainer. And that same is true for today's also. Most of the emerging economies, because they are facing the flight of capital, the currencies are depreciating. If you look at the Latin American economies, some of the economies like Venezuela, they have moved to the barter system because currency in a day depreciate by 40 to 50 percent. This is the kind of challenge which you have to face once you integrate with the global economy. In fact, uh, very few people would have believed Goldman Sachsman when he said in 2000 that uh, BRICS will be the superpower, economic power. His uh, prediction has come true for India and China at least. In fact, for India, he has forecasted that it will be the only country which will clock 5% plus GDP growth for next 50 years. In fact, growth will 
slow down in China, but we are all set to cross the growth and become the continue to become the largest growing economy in the world. But this kind of growth also comes with the challenges. And we have huge amount of challenges which we need to encounter and overcome if you want to be a really great economy. And our biggest challenges of the inclusive growth, the benefit of economic reform is not reaching the tier 2, tier 3 city and even the rural area and therefore there is strong opposition to the economic reforms also. We claim that one sixth of the world population lives in India, then one fourth of the world poor people also live in India. And around 287 million people, they earn less than one dollar per day. Even if you look at the illiterate, 35% of the world illiterate lives in our country. And I think these statistics should prickle our consciousness. We may become the fastest growing economy, but we can't be a great nation unless we make poverty in our country and bring those illiterate people to the literate level. The second uh, challenge to me for <clears throat> India is on the health sector. We are spending around 2% of the GDP on the health sector. A country of like US, which is eight times the size of Indian economy, spend around 17% of the GDP. Our per capita expenditure on health sector is less than $50 per person, which is probably better than some of the West African countries. And we all know that the public health sector is in shambles and private sector healthcare is beyond the reach of most of the people. It is good that government is talking about covering 100 million families in the national insurance plan where they will be providing health coverage to persons. And I think this is something which needs to be supported by the industry in a big way. The third big challenge for me is in the education sector. I firmly believe that the vocational training has to be part of the education sector and very few people should move to the higher education. There have been question marks about the employability of the persons who are coming from various engineering and medical colleges. I was talking to one day the president of Hyderabad Industry Association and he told me that for recruiting three electrical supervisors, he called 35 electrical engineers from in and around Faridabad and asked the question, what is the purpose of a three wire and three point plug? You wouldn't believe only three out of the 35 students could respond to the question. And that is something I think which is true when we talk about the most of our education system. There's hardly any standardization of education in our country. We have best of the education institution, maybe IIT, IM, and other institutions like that. But then we have institutions where anybody with a deep pocket can walk through the degree. And that's why globally countries are not willing to accept our degree. And that requires soul searching on our part also. A related issue which I firmly believe is that the teachers has to be best paid in the country. If US has become the education leader, it is just because of that. They are basically raising a generation. And if you are not attracting the best talent, you are losing the opportunity. Coming to the economy, I think uh, manufacturing sector is also posing a lot of problems. In fact, uh, manufacturing contribute to just less than around 14% of the GDP, though we are looking into now, Industrial Revolution 4.0, where we want to take it to 25% of the GDP. It's a huge challenge. Manufacturing is important in a country like India because you have 49% of the population of agriculture, which contribute to around 15% of the GDP. How you provide seasonal employment or additional employment to people who are working in the agriculture sector? They cannot be employed in services sector. In fact, uh, India is the only country which defied the normal or the conventional economic transition where a country moved from an agriculture economy to a manufacturing economy and then to a service economy. We migrated directly from agriculture economy to a service economy which has created huge problem. 
The good thing is that government is keen to address the problem and they are bringing focus on manufacturing sector. They have launched Make in India, the, and I think roughly three years are over. There are few good examples which has come. In fact, uh, you must have heard or you must have seen in the newspaper that Samsung is putting a semiconductor plant in Noida, which is being inaugurated by Prime Minister today. And I feel that we have to look into the hub and spoke model where we attract a large company into the country and allow SMEs to come as ancillary unit to those companies. Uh, we are very happy that Apple is also looking into investment in India in a big way to use India both for its domestic market and more importantly for export sector. Infrastructure is something which is high on the agenda of the government because the kind of growth which we are projecting would not be able to be achieved unless we have infrastructure in place, be it road, be it railways, air, airports, or you can call the shipping industry. Uh, luckily for us, the GST has come as a boom for the infrastructure and logistics sector. GST, the biggest achievement is that it has made India a single country. It is not that you are passing the goods from one state to other, and every state you are paying the taxes and other issues. The infrastructure investment is expected to touch around $1.7 trillion. In fact, uh, by the 2022, we are expected to invest around $1.2 trillion in infrastructure alone. And I'm sure that uh, only 30% of that will come from the government, rest will come from the private entrepreneurs. And let me tell you, there is no dearth of capital in India. If you provide a proper, stable policy regime, where you do not tinker with your tax administration now and then, people are willing to invest in India. And credibility of India in investment is pretty high. The other issue which comes to our mind is to make India the knowledge capital of the world. In fact, you will be happy to know that 350 out of Fortune 500 companies have their R&D base in India because we have the analytical human manpower in India. Roughly 38% of the Intel employees are in Indian. Uh, a quarter of Google employees are Indian. And if you go through NASA, you will be nostalgic because 40% of the NASA scientists are Indian. We need to capitalize on them. Unfortunately, our R&D investment is one of the lowest in the world. We invest around 0.6% to 0.7% of the GDP on the R&D. China has spent 2.1%. If you look at US, US spent 2.8%. South Korea has spent 4.2%. Israel has spent 4.8% of the GDP. In fact, there are only 17 companies in top 2,500 R&D spending companies, which are Indian. In uh, these 2,500 companies, there are 350 companies which are Chinese. And that's why China is dominating. People are treating that China is a manufacturing superpower. Days are not long when China will be dominating the services sector, the kind of investment China is doing in the artificial investment in a big way. And that is challenge which we have to face. Uh, I personally feel that uh, Indians are lacking entrepreneurship. Uh, I think it's the fear of the loss which is discouraging the students and others who are coming to try the entrepreneurship. Uh, though, of course, the government is looking at uh, providing an ecosystem for entrepreneurship to thrive in. I was going through an article on economists, and the article very cogently pointed out that entrepreneurship will move from Europe to Asian countries. And they have cited that the average age of the Western Europe is 48 years. If people with an average age of 48 cast their vote, they ask a government to provide them the social security. So most of the fund in Europe will go for the social security, leaving very little for entrepreneurship to be developed. And that's why the Asian country will have to take lead in the entrepreneurship. We, in fact, the government two years back has formed an venture capital fund of 10,000 crore. We have brought in a startup policy where huge concession has been given to the startup. The government is willing to provide a supportive, conducive ecosystem for the startups to thrive in the country. You will be happy to know that 
we ranked third in the startup in the world. Unfortunately, most of the startups in India are basically on the aggregators and uh, distributors model. I would like a startup to come into the core manufacturing. That is something which is really liked in the country and which is really desirable in the country. And therefore, I would urge you people not to be a job seeker. Please be a job provider. Look into the possibility of turning into the entrepreneurship. But those who are looking into the jobs, let me tell you the jobs of future will be technology driven. The recruiter will not be judging you on IQ, they will be judging on TQ. Therefore, if you want to go for the job, please adopt technology in your part of life. And, and I'm talking about technology, it is not just the mobile and the web based. Move to artificial intelligence, move to robotics, move to the technology which are yet not surface into the country and one has to keep up the state of that. Last point which I would like to make before I go to the brief presentation is that intelligence is something which is in case required. It is not that the TQ which will drive the world. And let me quote that Hitler has said that the empire of future will be the empire of mind. And with so many young minds and vibrant mind present, I'm pretty sure that we have a very vibrant future. So with these words, I thank one again to the institute, to the faculty for giving me them. For structured discussion, I will be taking a very brief PowerPoint presentation and I will welcome any question on any slide or thereafter. Thank you. Uh, India at the moment is the 11th largest uh, market uh, economy based on the current exchange rate. Uh, though of course when you are talking about the purchasing power parity, by 2020 we will be the largest economy bypassing all the countries including Japan and uh, Germany. We are the fastest growing economy, uh, a tag which we have got in the last quarter of 2017. <coughs> in fact, we had that ranking in 2016-17, lost for a few quarter to China, but again we have gained it. And I'm pretty sure we can look for being the fastest growing economy in the world for next 40 years, 30 years or so. We have the advantage of uh, young population, that's why people talk about the demographic dividend. If we can harness our youth power, I'm pretty sure that we can be the supplier of uh, manpower to the rest of the world. And that's why one of the skill development mission is looking into the possibility of skilling youngster to go to Central uh, Asian countries, go to Europe and go to the Latin American countries where there is huge demand for the youngster. In fact, you will be happy that Japan has recently opened its door for the IT people. They are inviting around uh, 0 0.2 million people in the IT industry from India. Uh, Japan, which is a totally conservative country, has not opened its door so far. But they are realizing that they require you to drive the country and that is something which will be in India's favor. Uh, we have the advantage of the market. Uh, middle class is growing every year and we will be having around 1.2 trillion people as middle class by 2013 and that's why all the global major players are looking towards India. Huge investment is coming into India not because uh, they want to produce it but they are also looking at the market which we are providing. We have the second labor, largest labor force in the world and that is something which we are proud of it but let me tell you that uh, the advantage, the leverage of uh, wages will no longer be the country like India unless we skill our worker. And that's why now we are losing out to some of our competitors to countries like Bangladesh, Myanmar, Col uh, Colombo, sorry, Sri Lanka, Vietnam, Cambodia. As when it comes to the per unit price, they are more competitive than India. Though of course wages are lower in India, but since it is not commensurate with the productivity, the business is going to these countries. We are very high on global manufacturing competitiveness and this is something which will surprise you. Boston Consulting Group has carried out a study which showed that India is the second most competitive country so far as cost within the factories are concerned. We become outpriced because of our high cost of credit and the logistics cost. So if we are able to contain both these, I am sure we will be one of the most competitive country in the world. 
there are sunrise sector of india we are already the world leaders in generics in pharmaceuticals in fact we are the largest producer and exporter of generics in the world uh, but if you talk about the value we are the fourth largest in the world but in terms of uh, quantity we are the largest one the other area of sunrise sector is the biotechnology sector where we are now seeing around 35 percent year on year growth which is one of the highest in the world and i'm sure those who are looking into an opportunity in biotechnology can definitely move to this sector a telecom sector we have already talked about it is not only the mobile it is the web based application also which are being now made in india most of the startups who have come are they are the startups in this field there are large number of those who are developing androids apps also into the country and supplying to the rest of the world we are already the world largest exporter in small car segments but we will the world largest vehicle producer by 2020 a uh, lot of foreign investment has come into the country and though of course we have a very high tariff which is something which is being objected by the us also still it has helped india to attract the fdi in this sector we have excellent network of the banks financial institution and it is credit to the government that uh, in the jan dhan yojana they have provided a bank account to a record number of population and achievement which is now being replicated in many of the other countries and as i told you that uh, we will be investing a lot in infrastructure to address the issues which are related to the deliveries and i think we are looking into now integrating our entire supply chain in a big way uh, we have a very liberal fda policy in fact most of the sector of economies are open except for a very limited sector there because of different region we have restricted those sector we will discussing on that a uh, lot of foreigners they complain that india hardly have a patent treaty our stand is that we have a patent treaty this is totally wto compatible we have a special safeguard for the patent product patient as well as the process patent as a part of our infrastructure improvement we are looking into the industrial corridor and the zoo you must have heard about the delhi delhi mumbai industrial corridor where we are investing close to 9 billion dollar in developing five cities across the industrial corridor which will be a game changer uh, we launch special economic zone with much fanfare in 2000 but uh, over a period of time due to tax controversy the special economic zones have not taken off there is a rethinking of the government to build on the special economic zone uh, i personally feel that a special economic zone should be a huge zone like china the difference between india and china so far the special economic zone are two fold one is that in china they are set up by the government in india they are set up by the private sector or as a joint venture between in, between the private companies and the government and secondly in india most of them are very small one except for few like mundra in uh, which is developed by adani and few others rest are there only for the tax concession so we have around 350 special economic zone out of that 265 are for the it where you just create a building and people with a laptop move to the special economic zone the idea of a special economic zone is that since you cannot develop the infrastructure across the country you provide world class infrastructure within a limited geographical area and that is something which is now the thinking of the government uh, india has been a great votary of the wto in fact you must have heard in the newspaper may have in the tv and must have seen in the newspaper that we say that we are there to strengthen the multilateral institution like wto which has to take a call on the unilateral announcement being made by us and then counter claim by the other partners country we cannot enter into these kinds of the trade war uh, at the moment i call it a tariff war which may translate into a trade war but this is not good for the world economy it will impact all countries the degree will differ countries like india china usa they will not be the major sufferer the major sufferer will be the export driven economy of singapore malaysia south korea japan they will suffer a lot 
One reason is that now two thirds of the global trade happens through value chains, and value chains are across the country. So when you are targeting, let us say China is targeting US or US is targeting China, it is not that these countries are affected. A lot of investment to these countries are from the other countries who are part of a global value chain. And once trade is reduced, these global value chain will be impacted. Uh, an offshoot of that would be increasing dumping, because if you are stopping the country, the major player, not to supply, not to export to the major countries, they will find some avenues to dump the goods into some other markets. And that's why every country is watching these development very closely. The rising international trade, we have already talked about uh, the international trade in India is growing and we are now looking into taking it to a $2 trillion by 2025. We have now GST regime in place and GST has been a game changer for Indian economy. Let me tell you, people have some reservation on the GST. Though, of course, the implementation was not the ideal one, but I think over a period of time, both the government and industry has learned from the mistake, and now we are set to get the best out of the GST. Uh, when it comes to the economic opportunity for the investor, Mapplecroft has said that India is the number one country for investment. In fact, return on investment in India is probably highest in the world. That's why multinational and the foreign companies are making beeline for investment in our country. Uh, as I told you, on FDI, we have a totally liberal FDI sector, except for 15 sector, which is satellite broadcasting, print electronic media, banks, and multi-brand retail. We have restricted the FDI. In the rest of the sector, there is FDI. When we are talking about the free FDI, it can be either under the automatic route or under the government approval route. Now, 95% of the FDI are under the automatic rule. That means you do not require any permission for investment to flow into these FDI. Recently, only government has increased FDI in defense and insurance sector from 26 to 49%, and we have increased it to 100% in railway infrastructure <coughs> project. When we are talking about the tax reform, I think the biggest tax reform has been the GST. GST has integrated 43 central and state taxes into single tax. So look at it from the point of view of an industry which is required to deal with 10 tax authorities. They will be dealing with only one tax authorities. The biggest advantage of the GST is that it takes away the cascading effect of the taxes, except for very few goods and services on which you are not entitled for input tax credit. On most of the services which you are taking, you are entitled for the tax credit. So it makes you competitive. Uh, and I think when I talked to a number of SMEs also, they were very clear that because of the GST, they are in a position to reduce the prices. Uh, unfortunately, initially it has not happened because people were not sure whether they will get the input tax credit. But now since the input tax credit is freely flowing, we are seeing the goods prices will come down into the country. And uh, I think a full credit to the government that government has been able to contain the inflation. In most of the countries, wherever GST was introduced in the first year, there has been the record inflation. And that's why the government which has introduced the GST has never come back to the power in those countries. You must have seen in Malaysia, they have launched the GST, but then they have scrapped it very slowly. And that's why I think Indian experience has come quite handy, and they have been able to roll out successfully. Uh, the biggest concern of an investor is when you change the rules retrospectively. And I firmly believe that games of the rules should be told before the games start. So if you have told the investor that this is the policy, you are not supposed to change the policy retrospectively. Uh, we had paid a high price for the tax dispute in case of Vodafone, and a lot of uh, investment has taken out of the country which was in the pipeline. And that's why I say that if the tax dispute of 5,000 crore just means a billion dollar, and you, that has affected 100 billion dollar investment to the country. Uh, the good thing is that government has made it a policy that there will be no retrospective amendment in the taxation, which has given a sigh of relief to the investor. Uh, we are on our course to reduce the corporate tax rate. The government has already announced that over a period of time. 
corporate tax rate would be reduced. And let me make it very clear, we are not reducing the corporate tax rate so that the industry gets benefit. We had to compete with other countries. US had initially reduced the corporate tax rate to 25%. So a foreign investor who is looking at India can easily look at the US also. So that's why to be in line with the global development, we have to look into that. Uh, we have also taken a call and abolished the wealth tax, which was causing huge amount of inconvenience. And we have also reduced the general anti-avoidance taxation regime also. When it comes to the infrastructure, government is investing a lot in infrastructure. We are looking into the economic corridor. We are looking into the industrial corridor. We are talking about the smart cities. In fact, India has already identified 104 smart cities to develop into the country, and they will be the state of art cities, which will be a green city, a self-sustaining city. We are similarly developing the industrial corridor also. Delhi Mumbai industrial corridor has been talked about. Five industrial five smart cities will come on the industrial uh, Delhi Mumbai industrial corridor also. Similarly, we are coming with Mumbai Bangalore economic corridor, Chennai Bangalore economic corridor, Chennai Vizek industrial corridor, Amritsar Kolkata industrial corridor, and we are also setting up 17 new industrial and manufacturing zone into the country. Uh, an industrial and manufacturing zone will be much more than a special economic zone. A special economic zone is in a very limited area. When we are talking about the industrial zone, we are talking about cities to be converted into an industrial area. And that will provide the wherewithal. And it will help again in the, in the spokes model where you are asking the companies to come and set up around the hub which is being created by a foreign investment. We are also coming with the freight corridor because we have seen that the cost of logistics is pretty high in India and the government is coming with the dedicated freight corridor. Uh, we are talking about a freight corridor which runs from Ghaziabad up to the JNPT Nawashia. We are talking about the eastern corridor also which will run from Punjab to West Bengal. We have an east-west dedicated freight corridor. We have north-south dedicated freight corridor. The short point which I am making is that the logistics cost in India is probably one of the highest in the world. We spend around 14% of the GDP on the logistics. EU and US, uh, they spend around 8% on the logistics. And if we are able to save the 6% cost of the GDP on the logistics, it will be a game changer. The good thing is that government for the first time has created a department of logistics to have a holistic view of logistics. Earlier, different component of logistics was being looked after by different ministries. Still, it is being looked after by different ministries. But now you have a logistics division, which has been asked to integrate the work of all these agencies together. And government has declared uh, certain component of logistics for infrastructure, for example, warehousing, as a priority sector for the lending also, where concessional credit would be available to that. And I'm sure over a period of time, you will see that the logistics cost in India will also be brought down to below 10% of the GDP. Uh, it's the ease of doing business which <coughs> attract the foreign companies. And a uh, good thing is that uh, government of India is making conscious effort for the ease of doing business. When the new government came into power, India was ranked 145th position. Uh, recently, we have come up to the 100 position. We are looking that in next two years, we should brought it down to the 50 level. And if we come within first 50 countries of the world for the ease of doing business, it will be a huge support for the investor, huge support for the investment which will flow into the country. And government has taken uh, many micro issues also to address this. Uh, for example, they have moved to a completely electronic platform for maintenance of different kind of register required under the statutory act. Uh, it has been made very clear that there will be no visit of the factory by any inspector. If in any eventuality is required, it has to be approved by an officer, not below the rank of the joint secretary. They have extended the validity of industrial license to three years. After three years, they are planning to make it uh, online so that approval is automatically given uh, to create uh, an environment of certainty, they have introduced 
advance ruling for both direct tax and indirect tax. And advance rulings means if a company has any dispute or any, they want any opinion on any subject, they can ask the government to give opinion on the subject. And once the opinion is given, it is binding on all the authorities. So if you want, what is the taxation rate on this product? Um, the product is complex, but if the advanced ruling decide that X is the tax rate for the product, then it becomes binding on all the authorities. And that is something which uh, foreign investor, the domestic investor is looking in for the predictability. Uh, we have set up uh, investor relationship also basically to attract overseas investment. We have country specific desks also where investment is promoted. And uh, you must be happy to know that we are moving towards internationalization of document also. For exports and import, we used to have nine documents for export, which has been reduced to three. Similarly, for export, we used to have seven documents, which has now been reduced to three. Uh, globally, most of the countries are dealing with three documents. Some of the country, <coughs> if they are managing and merging both invoice and patent list, they work on the two documents. As I told you that, uh, Contrary to some impression which has been given by the foreign media, India has a completely WTO compatible trips regime in place. We have a patent act, we have design act, we have GI act, we have the copyright act, and we have a CG of patent design and trademarks. And all the process has been streamlined. If you file an application for a patent, a specific timeline for various activities has been provided, and they ensure that in any case, within two years' time, these patents are approved. If you look at some of the figure in 2018 financial year, we have approved around 4,126 patents, 7,252 design, over 44,000 trademarks, and geographical indication which is given for a product which is grown or which is made in a particular geographical area, we have given 21 these indication. Um, the geographical uh, indications are one way of promoting our traditional exports also. Uh, when it comes to the special economic zone, uh, like uh, any special economic zone in the world, these zones are considered as a kind of foreign territory where anything can be brought in without any taxation and duties. But if anything comes out from the special economic zone, to domestic area, that means other part of the country, it is treated as an import and full tax has to be paid on that. Uh, to encourage uh, private players to set up into the special economic zone, government has provided 100% income tax concession, where for the first year, 100% tax concession is given, next five years, 50% is given a tax concession, and in last five years, whatever you reinvest into the business, 100% of that is allowed as a tax deduction. Uh, we have exemption from central sales tax and earlier service tax, now it is GST. Uh, any imports or procurement by this special economic zone is free from the GST. Uh, when you look into the market taxes, uh, as I told you that uh, India has been growth votary of multilateral system and we always believe that it is the WTO discipline which will govern the global trade, but of late we realize that two-thirds of the global trade happens through intra-trade, intra-regional trade, and that's why of late we have also decided to engage ourselves with the rest of the world through free trade and preferential trade agreement. We have gone ahead and we have also brought into services and the investment also, and that's why we moved away from free trade area to comprehensive economic partnership agreement or comprehensive economic cooperation agreement. The CIPA and SICA are little expanded form of the FDA. Normally in FDA, I'm only talking about the goods. When I'm talking about the CIPA or SICA, I bring services as well as investment within the negotiation table. And that's why India, which initially has India ASEAN FTA, now we have Indian ASEAN SICA because we also negotiated services under this. We, with Japan, with South Korea, Malaysia, Singapore, we have a comprehensive economic cooperation agreement where we, on bilateral basis, are looking into the goods export, services exports and imports, as well as two-way investment. India has also supporting the South Asian region through SAFTA agreement where to most of our South Asian countries, 
Many of them are the least developed countries. We have provided them the tax concession and the import from those countries happens at zero duty in respect of the least developed country like Sri Lanka or Bangladesh. We have signed our preferential tariff agreement with far-flung neighbors also in the Latin America where five countries of the Latin America which are part of the Mercosur are in a kind of free trade agreement with India. If uh, we talk about the sum of the sunrise sector, unfortunately they are part of the Make in India program also of the government. Uh, automobile, we have already talked about that we are the largest exporter in the small car segment and we will be the largest one in the vehicle segment by 2020. Auto component is one area where our exports are thriving. Uh, let me tell you one thing very clearly. When it comes to competition with China, wherever any intellectual input is required, India is scored over China. And that's why in auto component sector, we are scoring over China. China has realized the fact and therefore China is entering into joint venture with a lot of Indian companies where they feel that R&D and pre-development competitive stage up to the sampling should be done in India and actual manufacturing takes place abroad. A lot of large companies in India have entered into this kind of joint venture with these companies for exports of auto components. Aviation sector in India is growing. You must be seen that uh, aviation sector is growing by around compound annual growth rate of 20%. And I'm sure that Chinese and Indian aviation industry is all set to boom. One estimate says that uh, Chinese and Indian airlines will be the biggest one by 2013. Uh, Chinese airlines today catering to around 500 million domestic passenger every year. And in India also we are talking about 100 million domestic passenger every year. These kinds of passengers are not available to any European or US based airlines. So these airlines are also take to talk. Uh, biotechnology we have already talked about. Chemicals we are one of the largest exporter of chemicals but we are one of the largest importer of the chemicals also. Uh, with a lot of production facility being closed down in China, uh, we are looking into opportunity in these areas also. Um, rest of that uh, is something which is in the pipeline. Electronics is something where the government is focusing a lot and you will be happy to know that Apple is also contemplating to set up their base in India for which the talks are going on between Apple management and the government of India. Food industry is which is one of the buzzing industries these days. Government has relaxed the FDI in the food industries also. And we are looking into setting up the mega food parks. Seven mega food parks have already been set up in different parts of the country. And uh, many more are in the offing. Uh, gems and jewelry is a traditional sector of export. This is extremely employment as 50 million workers are engaged in gem and jewelry sector. Unfortunately for last few months, uh, we are not seeing much exports of gems and jewelry and that's why government is very keen to provide <coughs> necessary support. One of the key reasons has been the lack of flow of the banking credit after some of the recent controversy, but uh, I'm sure government is quite conscious of the fact of huge employment in the sector and they will look into what best can be done so that the credit requirement of the industry is taken care. Leather industry is also booming in the country. In fact, uh, India is now competing with uh, Vietnam in particular for leather exports. Um, China, over a period of time, is exiting from all labor intensive sectors because with a population problem with working age population winding in China, it is consciously moving to high and medium technology sector of exports, leaving traditional sectors open for the Asian countries. And that's why India has huge opportunity. Pharmaceuticals, we have already talked about, we are one of the largest exporter of generics into the country. The need of the hour is that we develop our own patent so that we command the kind of premium which is available to the multinational pharmaceuticals into the country. Textile is extremely important for us. Uh, as uh, this is the second largest employer next only to the agriculture. Unfortunately, in apparel sector, we have huge competition, primarily because of two reasons. Some of the countries like Bangladesh, they have 100% income tax exemption, which they have extended to the apparel sector. Secondly, being the least developed country, when they export their goods to US or EU, they enjoy zero tariff, where on Indian product, there is tariff around 10%. 
Uh, services are equally important for Indian economy. In fact, uh, today it is the services which is driving the economy. Uh, services export last year clocked around 19.8 percent growth, as against merchandise sector which clocked around 9.7 percent growth. Um, um, the telecommunication, IT, and IT enabled services are dominating our exports of services. Roughly 60 percent of the total services fall into these categories, but there is Tremendous opportunity in other services, logistics we have already talked about, healthcare is other sector. In fact, uh, healthcare is something where the government of India is making conscious effort. Indian nurses are much in demand, Indian doctors are also in demand. Uh, government is looking into a special skill missions for the Indian nurses to train and supply to the rest of the world to take care of the aging population, particularly in the Europe and Japan. Uh, tourism, in any case, is one of the great source of uh, foreign exchange for the country. Unfortunately, we have more outbound tourists than the inbound tourists. We Indians are now emerging as a global trotter. Last year, we clocked around 10 million tourists into the country. But since eBay and uh, on arrival visa coming into the way and general climate being improved, I'm sure that tourism will pick up into the country also. The other areas which are just opening are the insurance. Um, we have seen that the FDI has been increased from 26% to 49%. There are foreign companies who are operating into India. Education is something where we need to look into more three of the services, whether Indian institutes can set up their branches abroad to provide the quality education. There is huge demand for many countries in Africa and even the CIS countries of the Indian institutes. We have to build on that. Banking sector is unique into the country, and when it comes to the mass banking, India can definitely take a lead and tell the world what has been done by us. Legal process outsourcing is a buzzing business. Uh, you will be surprised that uh, uh, an hour of a lawyer in UK cost around 200 pounds. The same kind of services in India by many companies in Guam is provided $50 per hour. Though, of course, from Indian standards, it looks pretty good amount, but uh, then there is a huge demand for the Indian lawyers. Uh, unfortunately, since we have not negotiated the legal services and there is no mutual recognition, Indian lawyers are not about, uh, allowed to contest in the UK court, nor the other way around. But you can provide the back office support and the huge demand for that. R&D, we have already talked about, we can be the world leader of R&D, but we require huge investment into that. Uh, unfortunately, private sector has not come into the R&D. Whatever little investment has happened, it has happened because of the government effort. Though, of course, it is too minuscule. Organized retail is booming. A lot of foreign departmental stores who are coming into B2B business are opening this. I was told that there is Thailand-based micro, micro group which is opening its first store in Delhi next month. There are other companies who are also in pipeline. IKEA is opening its store in Hyderabad. And there is huge opportunity for organized retail sector in India. So uh, just me sum up that uh, people say the best way to predict the future is to create it. And we say that to the foreigners, we say that come to India and secure your future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. My name is Aparanesh. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, I am from engineering background. Yeah. And uh, India is now focusing more on the manufacturing sector, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, as an engineer, I know that there are three components that drive the manufacturing facilities. That is man, machine, and energy. So China uh, this week has signed a pact with Russia for opening a port nuclear facilities in its own territory. Uh, India has only like 20, uh, 22 working nuclear power stations, whereas China has 15. So, and India is also depending upon their thermal power plants, which they are run by a coal-based uh, high-grade anthracite. In January, uh, the imports have in, uh, increased from 12 to 18% as I know that whole, uh, so from Australia and Indonesia, right? Uh, 
so why is it uh, India is focusing more on nuclear power plant? So in fact, uh, India is focusing on nuclear power plant. There are a couple of issues with regard to the nuclear club, which needs to be deliberated on that, which has come into the way of free supply of enriched uranium to these plants. This is something which is being negotiated and if India becomes a member of the nuclear club, I think it will be easy to that and that's why it is very high on the agenda of the Prime Minister when he meets any of the head of the important state. At the same time, we are looking into the renewable source of energy to supplement our energy need. You must be seeing that we are now looking into 100 gigawatts of solar energy. There are other renewable energy which are in place. You have rightly put up that uh, coal imports have gone up because there were a couple of issues with regard to allocation of coal. Unfortunately, the same has been stuck up due to some coal diesel and because of policy paralysis. I'm sure that uh, the kind of interest which is now being put on the energy sector, these issues will be taken care. The moment we ensure free supply of the enriched uranium, I'm sure India would be putting more atomic energy plants into the country. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, another uh, query I have that uh, you talked about GSP on small scale industries <laughs> and large scale industries. Well, it was helpful, really helpful, and it is right now it's being generated a great amount of revenue. But what about the micro scale, micro and small medium enterprises? Most of them have almost wiped out after the GST implementation. Now let me tell you two things. One is that a uh, lot of uh, micro units have wiped out because the demonetization has come as a shock to them. Lot of transactions in cash which used to happen have eliminated after the demonetization. In GST, there is a basic flaw. The flaw is that GST hardly have any exemption limit for micro and small unit. When you used to have an SSI regime, the production up to one crore was exempted from excise tariff, which is not the case in the GST. But the government has come with other solution to address that. They are coming with a public procurement policy where 15% price advantage is given for procurement for micro and small sector. So if a medium or large industry is providing a product at, let us say, 100 rupees and micro is providing at 125 rupees, the government is preferring to procure from the micro sector. Secondly, for micro, they have brought a bill that large scale industry needs to pay to the micro industry within a reasonable time frame, else bank facility will be extended to that. So I do agree with you, if you look at GST reform as such, since the exemption regime has gone, the advantage of taxation which was available to micro unit, that is no longer there. But in lieu of that, government has encouraged them by bringing the price preference policy for procurement. Thank you, sir. We have trade deficit. So, what are the measures that are being taken to take care of that trade deficit? In fact, uh, trade deficit uh, is an area of concern, more so non oil, non gold trade deficit. Uh, because if your oil requirement is going up, you hardly have a source of the crude in your country, you have to live with that. But even if you look at non oil, non gold imports, they have gone up around 83% in last one year. And that's why uh, when we met the Prime Minister, there was a clear understanding that we have to put focus on import substitution. You will be surprised to know that our electronic import bill in one year's time has moved from $41 billion to $51 billion. And that's why if you put focus on electronics and a lot of components which are being imported could be manufactured into the country we can definitely reduce the trade deficit. So for me, I think uh, what was the problem in the country why the trade deficit has grown? When you compare India with China, the fine distinction was that China always aligned its tariff policy with its FDI policy. Wherever they want to attract an investment, they purposely increase the tariff so that if the foreign supplier wants to supply, he has to come and establish base in the country. 
Unfortunately, we have not done so in the country. I was talking to a medical diagnostic supplier in China. He is supplying goods worth around $500 million to India every year. And I told him that why not you come and set up base in India. He said, why should I come and base in India? The tariff in your country is just 5%. I will pay 5% I'm more competitive here. Had the tariff been 25%, I could have looked at that. So we have not done that, but that is now, I think, too late in the day to look into those issues. The right now, the focus should be that the countries from where you are importing these products, try to bring foreign technology, try to bring foreign investment, and look into an import substitution regime for that. That is the best way to curb that trade deficit. So my name is Ayuzan. Uh, Sir, in the starting, you said that most people want to be an entrepreneur, but they they are lack of fear or they, they fear about it because of losses. So, sir, I knew some people who have experience in their field of four to five years, and they have a proper proper ability <coughs> that they success. But what the problem is lack of funds. So, what should we do? No, I think uh, there is a lack of awareness about the facilities which has been created in the country. Two years back, there has been a venture capital fund which has been launched with a corpus of 10,000 crore. And I was told that there has not been optimum utilization for the fund. A uh, lot of facility has been given to the startup. And I think the onus lies with the authorities to go and explain to the entrepreneurs. From entrepreneurs, I expect that since you people are the technology savvy, look at the website, look at what kind of facility, what kind of concession has been given to them. And uh, I think one need to look into those and those issues will be addressing your concern. Uh, if you have a good idea, let me tell you, there is no dearth of the financing in the country. There are venture capitalist funds who are waiting for a good idea to fructify. They are willing to invest on any good idea. So uh, the industry, I personally feel, need to do some kind of research on these projects. The authority should be a little proactive. Go and explain to the entrepreneur what facility has been extended to them. If entrepreneur has any problem, they need to do the hand-holding and resolve those problems. Thank you, sir. Yeah. So we have uh, seven slabs of GST, and in other countries, in comparison with other countries, uh, they have only two, three slabs. So what is the reason behind uh, we have so many slabs of GST? In fact, uh, the slab which you are talking about, they are rather exception. We normally consider four slabs. These are the problem of precious metal which has been dealt differently. But uh, let me just share with you what is the roadmap which I am visualizing at this point of time. We have 5, 12, 18 and 28 percent full slab of GST. There are only 50 products which are right now at 28 percent slab. I personally feel that over a year's time these 28 products will move to the 18 percent category. And I also look into 12 and 18 percent merging into 15 percent. So, a year after a year or so, we will have two tax rate, 5% and 15%. And as you must have seen that there is no talk about the single tax rate into the country. We are talking about the dual tax rate. Let us also keep in mind that India is the only second country after Canada, which has a federal GST structure. No other country has a federal GST structure. And since in India, we have a quite different strata of economic power which is in the country. We cannot manage at this moment a single tax rate, but I personally feel that two years down the line, we can look for two rate of 5 and 15 percent. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sanjay. My question is that Asian Investment Infrastructure Bank has uh, given a loan of $6.2 billion to India for the infrastructure development. And you have also mentioned that there is $2.1 trillion that are being invested for the infrastructure development. 1.2. 1.2 billion. Trillion. Uh, trillion. Yeah. So after that also, 
the infrastructure development in India is facing a lot of problems as comparable to other countries. What is the reason for that? Uh, in fact, uh, when you talk about the infrastructure, my advice will be don't compare with India to China. In okay. China, if I want to build a road, I will give three-day notice to all householders to vacate it. They will vacate in three days' time and I will build the road. I went to a small place in, known as Kunming in China, where they have made a world-class convention center. It took them exactly 270 days to build it from the scratch. They do it. But China would not be a right example. I personally feel that in India there was not much focus on the infrastructure. Luckily now we realize that we cannot move unless we have the infrastructure in place. And that's why we are talking about huge investment in infrastructure. Something good has been done. Uh, the infrastructure investment has improved and so is the performance of infrastructure fund. Uh, roughly two years back, we used to build around 17 kilometers a day of national highway. Today, we are building 28 kilometers a day of national highway. We have huge investment going into the Sagar Mala project where we are talking about connecting the ports. And it's a huge investment where we are talking about uh, close to five, 370 million to happen in that. Uh, if you are talking about the Airports, uh, unfortunately, our projection has been a little wrong. We never thought that we are grow we will be growing at a compound annual growth rate of 20% or plus. Though we have created a lot of airports, unfortunately, even in our T3, we are reaching near the proper stage, which is something needs to be avoided. So my intake could be that we are focusing on infrastructure. Things are improving. But since infrastructure itself has a huge gestation period, we have to be a little happy with whatever has been done and look for better performance in years to come. I, I think we can take one last question for the session. Very good afternoon, sir. My name is Rohan and it's glad to see you in the NDIM. Uh, my question is that do you think so MNC companies are giving cutthroat competition to the small scale industries of India? So what is the future? Is it bleak or bright? Uh, why is it uh, any company in India uh, forget about the MNC? It has to compete with imports, more so imports which are coming the free trade areas. If you are competing with a, con with a product which is coming from Singapore at zero tariff, uh, whether you are competing with MNC in the country or you are com com competing with the import, it is one and the same thing. Uh, but uh, I think the advantage to Indian MSMEs lies in the fact that they have a lot of flexibility which is not with an MNC. So when it comes to the volume, it is well nigh impossible for Indian SMEs to compete with an MNC. Uh, if you look into the kind of model which is coming into the countries, totally a capitalist model where a large companies come and they kill the competition. Unfortunately, that has happened in many of the IT related sector. It has not happened in the manufacturing sector. So I think SMEs needs to look into where their core strength lies and they should look into a small volume, high value products for manufacturing. There is huge advantage on a handmade products into the country. And uh, our estimate says that the cost of a handmade product, if you are talking about general products, is 40 to 50 percent more than the machine made products. Can we produce those products in the SME sector is something that one needs to look for. Thank you so much.